want to thank everybody for being here today. My name is Marissa Ladderack, and I'm a principal regional planner here at SCAG. I'm also the director of SCAG's California Clean Cities Coalition. So I'm so pleased to be here today to share with you all what we're working on as far as smart cities goes and what we see for the future. Um, and of course, very, very much so looking forward to any questions and answers at the end um, and hearing from you all. So that being said, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, some housekeeping rules, and if anyone can't see my slide, let me know. Um, but for some housekeeping rules here, this meeting will be recorded. It's going to be an hour and a half long. Um, all participant lines are muted when you join. There will be a question and answer section at the end. Uh, if you do have any questions during any of the presentations, feel free to drop it into the chat. Um, you can also use your raised hand function. We will essentially be logging all of the questions. Um, if we've got time for all of the questions, great. If we get a ton of questions, we might have to select some. Um, but either way, drop your uh, questions into the chat, raise your hand, we'll get to them as best as we can. Um, additionally, Closed captioning is available if you click that show captions button in your Zoom room. Um, this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will all be made available on our website to you. So um, just as an FYI, those will go out as well. And then lastly, we have a survey at the end of the PowerPoint. Um, if you can take it, that'd be great. Helps us improve our future toolbox Tuesdays. So with that, we can go ahead and get started. So as far as our agenda today, I will be covering a brief overview of Smart Cities here at SCAG. Um, and then I will also later come back to talk about some program conclusions, uh, just our program tools and resources, generally speaking, and then you know helping to kick off our question and answer period. But in the middle of that, I'm so pleased we have three partner presentations. We have Zachary Campos from LADOT here, Caitlin Sims from the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments, and then also Christopher Mekin from the city of Laguna Woods. So very excited to hear from all three of them. Um, and we'll, without further ado, kind of get started here. So um, some questions we wanted to ask you before we jump into the presentation. It's really helpful for us to understand who our audience is. Um, we would love to know what type of organization do you represent? Um, there's a couple options here. We'll give it about a minute or so for the question. Um, and we thank you in advance for your participation. Ooh, we're seeing lots of local government folks on the line. Cool. We see some, ooh, we've got some tribal government, county government, school or academic institutions. Awesome. We see we've got almost, almost all the responses from the folks on the line so far. Give it just a few more seconds here. All right. Well, it looks like the majority of us here are local government, but it's exciting to see we've got government of multiple levels represented here um, and some tribal government folks on the line as well. So that's wonderful. Um, let's go to the next question. So for poll two, curious which area you were calling in from today? Uh, Beautiful, thank you. So uh, we've got a little graphic here on the side if you can see that as well, but um, are you calling in from somewhere in the SCAG region, somewhere else in California or the US, or maybe even outside of the US? And if so, I hope your time zone is kind to you. We'll give it a 30 seconds or so for this question as well. It looks like most folks are calling in from the SCAG region, so that's great. But I know we we promoted this too with our Greater Clean Cities Network and stuff. So there might be some folks from outside of our region. I see there's at least a couple. And it looks like just about all of us have responded. So um, we can go ahead and close that one up as well. Thank you very much. Glad to see most of us here, our SCAG region locals. Um, okay, so then for our next poll question, um, and these are our last two questions, but we're just kind of curious what technology you're most interested in. Um, and then additionally, what technologies have you worked with? Now, this first question is, what technologies are you most interested in? Um, and if you do not see the technology you want to talk about today represented here, um, please indicate it in the other, and then you can drop it in the chat as well. That's helpful for us. Um, we're going to be talking about all these things and then some today. So got lots of stuff to cover, but this is really helpful for us in, in gauging where your interests lie um, in seeing, you know, what what you might be most interested in pursuing. So I'll give it a couple more seconds here. 
It looks like most folks have submitted some responses. We'll give about 10 more seconds though. All right, smart parking. I see that's a big popular one. Smart vehicles, AI. Yep, those are those are all very popular. And we got a couple in the other as well. All right, well, we can go ahead and wrap up that question too. Thank you very much. And I guess we can just move on to the next one, which is our final question. Thank you for your, your participation and your patience here. Uh, the fourth question is just going to be what technologies have you worked with? So um, same options as previously, just curious if these are things that you have started working. Uh, maybe you're interested, maybe you have started working on some of these things, developing policies and whatnot. So um, very curious to see if this is something we've, we've started exploring ourselves or, or if we're just still interested. Oh, great. Nice to see a lot of folks are already doing the work with AI, open data. Yep, these are all very critical. Same with us. We'll give it another um, 10 or 15 seconds or so for folks to continue to respond. Maybe some of you haven't started working with many of these at all, and that's okay, too. Um, if you're not responding because the answer is none of the above, that is perfectly fine as well. All right, well, looks like that's probably as many participants as we'll get for that question, so we can go ahead and close it. But thank you again. Very helpful for us um, as we understand, you know, what your priorities are and what you're most interested in learning about today and just long term. So really appreciate that. Thank you for your participation. And we'll just kind of continue on here. So jumping into the PowerPoint, that brief overview I promised about smart cities at SCAG. So if you're not familiar with SCAG, although I'm sure many of you on the line are, um, we are the Regional Metropolitan Planning Organization for Southern California for the six counties that does not include San Diego County. Um, and our goal really is to help unify and bring everyone together so we can all work towards one brighter future for Southern California. Um, and you know, you'll see these are the four kind of buckets in which we do a lot of our work, transportation, housing, advocacy, tools and resources. Um, today, this is Toolbox Tuesday. So this is one of those tools and resources. You know, we want to provide you with all of the updates on what we're working on, all of the tools and resources that we've built over the last couple of years, um, and then answer any questions that you have. And as far as SCAG's primary roles and responsibilities, and again, I'm sure that many of you are familiar with these, but you know, we've got our regional transportation plan, our sustainable community strategy, which we'll talk a little bit about today because some of our smart cities um, projects are within that umbrella. We also have our federal transportation improvement program, our regional housing needs assessment. Uh, we also have regional data and information sharing. That's a really big one for us. We'll talk about that today too. And then additionally, we always like to provide forums for discussing issues of regional significance which is what we're doing here today. We're talking about smart cities. So um, love to see that in action. Now, as far as our smart cities programming efforts, what have we been up to in the last couple of years? Well, we established the Clean Transportation Technology Policy, which was adopted by our regional council. We also completed an electric vehicle charging site suitability study, and we have our PEV Atlas, um, which is a great resource as well. We recently updated that with our suitability findings. We've completed our Clean Technology Compendium. We also completed some emerging technology guiding principles. We've been doing partnerships with our goods movement team here. So you maybe have heard about our zero emission truck infrastructure or ZETI study, or potentially our last mile freight program or LMFP. Uh, we also have the Southern California Clean Cities Coalition partnership, which I mentioned at the beginning here. Um, and through that partnership, we have other partnerships, including ones with um, the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator or LACI, if you're familiar with them, or University of California, Irvine. We're doing some work with them in the AI space as well. Um, so lots of partnership opportunities through the Clean Cities Coalition. We also have our Emerging Technologies Committee, and we always strive to provide education resources and tools whenever possible. And this is this is um, 
you know, an example would be our participation in the ride and drive events that you've potentially seen us at, um, our participation in alternative fuel vehicle expos, things like that. Um, we're always putting together educational panels and programming for our policy committees. Uh, and, you know, we're always trying to support as well for the ever-changing landscape of federal and state regulations when it comes to clean technologies and clean transportation and smart cities, things like that. Now taking a step back, a little bit of a historic crash course on smart cities here at SCAG. Um, a lot of what we do today was originally born out of our policy, the Future Communities Framework back in 2017. Uh, this was our formal smart cities policy for a good chunk of time. It spun off a number of other programs. Um, this framework that we created really supported as our role um, in a, as a leader in technology and innovation and really helped to emphasize that role. And uh, the framework outlined several critical program areas, some of which you've probably heard of and we'll talk about today. Those include the regional data platform and the future communities pilot program. So the future communities pilot program, maybe y'all are familiar. Um, this is something that was originally started in fiscal year 19-ish. Uh, so it's been a couple of years, but the goal of this program was to apply new technologies and data analytics to reduce VMT, vehicle miles traveled, and greenhouse gases, um, GHG. Additionally, other benefits included to improve the efficiency of municipal services and then to promote replicable um, pilots in the region to make sure that anything that you know we're working on could be replicated elsewhere. Um, and then additionally, this program aligned our pilots with our long range planning, which you've all I'm sure heard of uh, our regional transportation plan, also known as Connect SoCal. So, you know, this was one of those programs where we had an opportunity to align everything. And I will talk more about these after the partner presentations, but um, the, here's the list of all of the projects that were awarded for uh, the Future Communities Pilot Program. And we'll talk about the findings in a little bit. They include things like um, Anaheim, Cerritos, Los Angeles, Ontario. We're looking at everything from parking, smart parking, to online permitting, uh, electric car share, things like that. And we also have Glendale, Monrovia, Riverside, and San Bernardino County. And again, we're looking at a variety of different project types here. We've got route optimization, we've got bike share, um, more online permitting, more online types of solutions. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit. Now, moving from there, we went to our Sustainable Communities Program, which I mentioned a little earlier, the Sustainable Communities Strategy, SCS. That's something we always do here at SCAG. The Sustainable Communities Program has been around for a long time, so you've maybe heard of it. Um, this is one of our main vehicles for implementation following when we update Connect SoCal. So that's our regional transportation plan that we update every four years. Uh, and this is one of the main vehicles that we use for infusing dollars into the region for implementation related projects. So we were able to build upon the future communities framework in the pilot program there and we were able to essentially develop this second round of pilots. And this, this was for our smart cities and mobility innovations, technically call three, as we've referred to it in the past. Um, but this is under that umbrella, that sustainable communities program umbrella. And we were able to fund another batch of smart city related projects through this program. And there will be opportunities in the next fiscal year for another round of these types of projects. So we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Now, as far as the Smart Cities and Mobility, Mobility Innovations program itself, SCMI, uh, we really wanted to focus on a couple of key things that we identified in Connect SoCal 2020. Those things are our smart cities and job centers, go zones, and shared mobility and mobility as a service. So, um, you know, we really wanted to see innovative projects that helped us to accelerate in those connections. We really wanted to see projects that had a lot of innovative technology where they could build in solutions to the types of challenges that they faced. Um, in this translated into a couple of different project types, mainly curb space data collection um, and inventory. And then we also have technology assessment or adoption and then parking management. Now, again, I will go into more details about all of these pilots and projects, but first I wanted to turn it over to our partners to get some in-depth technical expertise and experience and insights from them. So that being said, just real quick, I'll run through these. You know, we have 
the city of LA. Uh, we also have San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments and the Laguna Woods. Those are all folks that are here today to tell you about these projects. And we'll talk more about them later. But we also have some other interesting projects that we'll talk about. And they include Rialto's Smart Cities Plan for Warehousing and Logistics. Uh, Long Beach and Stanton were both doing curb management studies. And then Desert Hot Springs and Garden Grove were both doing parking studies. So a lot of really good insights that we will be sharing from those as well. But uh, before that, I want to jump into our partner presentation. So I will turn it over to our first partner. We have Zach Campos from LA who will be um, showing his slides. I will stop sharing my screen uh, and turn it over. Thanks, Marissa. Um... Can you all see that? Yep. All right, great. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. My name is Zachary Campos. I am a transportation planning associate with LADOT, and I'm here to, today to talk a little bit about our curve space data collection and inventory study um, that we conducted. So uh, just a little bit of background is that uh, we built off of the existing uh, curb space study that was conducted in June 2022. Uh, we weren't necessarily actively involved in that round of data collection and uh, implementation. However, we did look towards this study to uh, really inform how we might choose our site selection um, and a pilot recommendation for a uh, curb space study. Um, and it's really timely given the fact that we are really looking towards the future on how do we best manage our curb spaces for uh, events like the Olympics or the World Cup. And so thinking about how can we really dynamically manage the curb space. Um, and so some of the things that we really pulled from this study and applied it to um, this, this current uh, curb space management study was data collection and data consolidation practices. Um, some of the, the our site selections, as well, I'll talk a little bit uh, about in a bit. And then some of the best practices for data collection and when to use certain practices and where to use them. So here's a, a real quick roadmap of, you can see uh, how we kind of built off of that 2020 study uh, in this for this one, we worked with our partners at CityFi. Um, again, really helped us flesh out uh, those data collection uh, practices and helped us collect uh, data at six different sites and evaluate all of those. Uh, they helped us define key um, curb typologies, those best practices, and then ultimately that pilot recommendation. And now we're using a lot of these findings um, specifically for the, the recommended pilot, but also other projects that we're uh, looking to do curb management. Um, and we have another project called Code the Curb, uh, which is a little bit different, and I can talk a little bit, a little bit later. Um, but really, our vision and goal for this uh, kind of started off with the three pillars of right, safety, equity, and sustainability, um, and really thinking about uh, all the curb users and how do we prioritize them at the curb, um, especially with such large demands at the curb? So within these three, we really wanted to focus on some of the messaging and um, garnering support from city departments, as well as local officials and the public, um, because these are new technologies. And um, we want to ensure that we are applying them properly and that everyone is informed about them. Um, we also wanted to investigate opportunities to collaborate with partner technologies, um, use GS based mapping tools, some video technology tools, um, and then ultimately use it to relay information that we collect at the curb to users through uh, digital curb uh, signs. Um, so that way folks can know curb space designations more clearly, specifically along commercial and mixed use street types. So some of the challenges that we saw um, as we were going through this study were right right now, um, it's no surprise, but the the curb 
currently is uh, prioritized for parking. We have a lot of passenger parking. Um, however, we do know that the curb has multiple uses, right? We have um, folks who are using it for passenger parking. We have it for delivery vehicles. Um, our new uh, micromobility programs, um, we have pedestrian activities, and then we also have other uses such as food trucks. So how do we accommodate all of these uses at the curb? And something that we found uh, was even if we have these these policies in place, you know, sometimes folks don't really uh, follow these policies and procedures. And so uh, one of the things that we kind of found was there is a mismatch between the supply that we have and the demand. And so that kind of leads us into some of the findings and why we chose our pilot recommendation. Um, so I'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about site and kind of that recommendation. So um, as we were thinking about smart technologies that we could apply throughout the city, we took a look at several criteria. Um, these were the primary ones. So uh, we had a parametric model, a hotspot map that really identified land use types, um, city input, and really using um, internal staff uh, knowledge of landscapes within these areas, things from our planning teams, our parking enforcement teams, um, and just some of the, the stakeholder information that we had received in the past. Areas where there was existing infrastructure, on-street parking, uh, transit. Again, we want to be able to uh, accommodate all user types, whether it's you're making that trip via transit or uh, as an active uh, transportation user, um, deliveries, and then parklets. And then these were the six neighborhoods that we had identified, Westwood, Palms, Downtown LA, Sherman Oaks, Highland Park, and uh, North Hollywood. Um, and we landed on a Westwood site. And this is kind of how we had put it together. But um, for this particular project, we noticed that this area is primarily uh, commercial. It has a uh, commercial land use type. And um, we had a lot of information from uh, previous stakeholder engagement, as well as city staff that had seen a lot of violations within this area with respect to delivery zone parkings. And what we found was that folks would park uh, unsafely, whether that's in a travel lane, in a center, center lane, or utilizing no parking zones and cutting off visibility, which creates a, a safety hazard for all user types. Um, the other things that we took into account is that um, it's heavily utilized during peak hours, um, and those can change de depending on also the season. Uh, so typically, it's this, this is close to UCLA, so um, during uh, months where school is in session, there tends to be more activity, and so there are more competing uh, uses at the curb during these times. So our recommendation that we kind of arrived at was this idea of a flex zone. So um, again, as I mentioned earlier, there, there really is a mismatch between the existing supply and demand. And so with our partners, we went out and we collected data um, and inventoried the curb. So if you see right here on this slide, you'll notice that we have 37 paid parking spaces, uh, a passenger loading, uh, several no stopping zones in those red curb zones, um, uh, fire hydrants, vehicle access, emergency vehicle access, and, and curbside patios. So um, the recommendation that we came upon were how can we effectively enable multiple uses and adapt some of these uses for uh, deliveries so that um, uh, delivery vehicles can, um, not have to use the center lane or a travel lane or passenger pickup and drop offs, short-term parking, uh, and so on. And the, the way that we would achieve this is through, um, 
digital digital uh, parking regulation signage uh, that enables us to relay the current information uh, to users at the curb. So whether or not it is a, a loading zone at that given time or if it is a parking zone. So just real quick on some of the lessons that we've learned, this has been a, a really invaluable uh, lesson to us, um, mostly with the data collection and inventory needed to uh, pilot this uh, this project and ensure its success. Uh, we, we did inventory this particular area, but um, one thing that I didn't touch on too much is the best practices that we learned were how best to apply certain data collection methods. And um, there are certain ones that work really great at the really small scale. However, when you're looking at larger scales, if we're looking at um, like less densely populated areas, uh, a mobile mapping solution might be uh, really applicable here and help uh, achieve that scale of data collection. The other aspect is how to integrate some of those data demand needs uh, with existing systems of our asset management system so we can effectively manage these. Because one of the other things that we found was um, the question of how do we keep these, these inventories up to date um, and how often should we be keeping them up to date? And we can rely on some of our existing data sources to kind of supplement that so we can um, not have to necessarily always go out into the field and do inventory because that can be timely and costly. Uh, and then really helped us get an idea for new technologies that are out there and how to best apply them for a curb space management program. And so you can kind of see this this little uh, image here of what that that dynamic uh, managed curb sign would look like along with some of our other technologies that we've uh, identified through this pilot. So um, yeah, for the, this particular project, we're, we're looking to implement it um, sometime in the future, but we do have a lot of other pilots that are similar in curb, curb space management. And so again, many of the findings that we find that we have gotten through here are feeding projects that uh, like code the curb. And we also have a zero emission delivery zone um, project that has gained some insights from this. So uh, really great study. And so appreciate SCAG for helping facilitate this. Um, I know we have a question section later on, but I don't know if we wanted to do questions here or if I should pass it on to the next speaker. You know what? We've got a little bit of time if there's a question or two we want to do first before we pass it on. But otherwise, yeah, we can also just do questions at the end. And if for any reason we we can't get to questions, uh, my email is right here. Uh, feel free to send me an email. Wonderful. Thank you. Do we have any quick questions before we move on to the next presentation? I don't see any raised hands right now. Okay. Okay. Well, thank cool. you so much, Zach. We really appreciate it. We can turn it over to Caitlin Sims next, and we'll keep on moving along. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Sims. I am the manager of local programs at the San Diego Valley Council of Governments. And I really appreciate the invitation today to talk a little bit about our Go SGV bike share program and the project that we did with SCAG as part of this, their Smart Cities and Mobility Innovation Program. So before jumping into the project that we actually did as a part of this, um, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the background of the program, of the project itself, the Buggo SGV Bike Share Program. Um, we launched it uh, thanks to a grant that we received back in 20, 2017, uh, part of the ATP program, to launch a regional e-bike share program in the Sangra Valley um, with 840 e-bikes as a dockless program. And the intent of the grant was to fund the infrastructure and program startup. So we always intended, and we actually launched that, as a traditional bike share program where users could check out bikes, there'd be stations located within the public right-of-way, 
um, residents, whoever could check out a bike, use it for a short period of time and return it to another station, or since this was a dockless program, uh, another location. Um, we conducted, had a procurement, we contracted with Gotcha Mobility and actually launched the program. Um, but the program, unfortunately, was pretty significantly impact by COVID, impacted by COVID-19. We initially planned to launch in the spring of 2020. I think we all know what happened then. So that pushed back the operation, the, the launch to the summer and fall of 2020. Um, and it also just did a number on Gotcha as a company. So they ultimately dissolved and ceased all their operations in uh, late 2020 or early 2021. Um, so, and we have a little saying at the COG, it's a very common saying, but just basically every, every challenge is really an opportunity. So we took the opportunity to really reimagine what the program could look like to better serve the San Gabriel Valley. Uh, San Gabriel Valley, it's a relatively um, suburban region. There's not a lot of density in most places. There's not a lot of bike infrastructure. Um, so we really talked with our stakeholders, with our cities, our um, nonprofit partners, others that were really in this space to try to figure out a new approach that might work a little bit better for the San Gabriel Valley um, to have the impacts that we were all hoping for to really reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled within the region. So we really landed upon was this concept of longer term bike checkouts. So rather than a, a user using the bike um, just for a short period of time, grabbing it from a uh, station on the public right of way, um, they could check it out from a, another location off of the public right of way um, and then use it for a longer period of time, for example, like even a month or longer as their own. And what we really wanted to do is focus on partners that would be most likely to use the program. So students at colleges, and universities, um, employees at large businesses with kind of a campus environment um, in order to really target where we thought the most the greatest impact for VMT reduction might be. Um, and on top of the where we thought the greater impact um, for VMT might be, also potentially reducing the operational costs. These bike share programs are pretty costly when you have to rebalance bikes within sta station locations all along the public right of way. Um, so we thought that these approaches would be good to uh, um, kind of reimagine what the program could look like. So we were able to ultimately um, launch in 2022. Um, we have 828. Um, e-bikes that are kind of standard commuter e-bikes, like the one you see on the top of the screen there, and 12 cargo e-bikes. And we selected a local nonprofit as our program operator, which is Active SUV, through a competitive procurement process. So we're super excited about the launch, um, but we still had some challenges to contend with. Um, oh, actually, I'm going to talk about the program first. Um, so just high-level program that San Gabriel Valley residents can sign up online for a monthly subscription. And as a part of that monthly subscription, they receive the e-bike itself. It's a, uh, the battery charger, which it can plug in, be plugged into any standard outlet, um, and then a lock as well. And the users just pay the deposit, and then there's a monthly subscri subscription cost. You can see the rates on the screen, and there's also reduced rates for students, uh, seniors, and other income-qualified residents. And users and Active SGV, as I said, is our program operator. So users can either pick up the bikes from Active SGV or they can have their e-bikes delivered for a fee. Um, so we were excited, obviously, about the program launch, but we did have some challenges in places where we really wanted to focus our efforts. For example, as I mentioned at the beginning, the grant was only for kind of the startup in the infrastructure, so we had no funding for operations or outreach. And so the membership fees that were collected, that would be collected from the participants, those are the only available funding. And we also had a very limited understanding of the VMT impacts. We obviously had a hypothesis that we thought that um, this type of program would be have, have a larger impact anyway on VMT and GHG, uh, but we didn't really know what it was. And that VMT impact we thought would be important um, for eligibility for future funding opportunities. So anything from AQMD or just really any funding opportunities around those GHG emissions or TDM um, programs as well. So that is where we were extremely excited uh, to partner, to have an opportunity to apply for the um, uh, Sustainable Communities Program, Smart Cities Mobility Innovation Program. Um, as I mentioned, our goals uh, for this particular program um, were to evaluate and better understand what the VMT and GHG impacts of, GH, of Go SGV were, and then also to implement more innovative outreach strategies to encourage Go SGV membership. 
And we really were really grateful to SCAG for their um, for awarding this project and allowing us the opportunity to really dive into these into these tasks. Um, and SCAG contracted with Alta Planning to complete this work. Just to give a slightly better idea of exactly what the project has been, and I'll note that we are nearing the end of the project, is not quite completed yet, um, but will conclude at the end of the year. And our major goals kind of fell into three major categories. First of all, we really wanted to better understand uh, the landscape and who really who the SUV residents were, what their concerns and motivations were around bike share or around bikes generally, and the kinds of things that might drive them both either to or away from Go SGV. Um, and as I'm sure no one is surprised to hear, one of the major challenges was the lack of bike infrastructure um, in the region, which was certainly con uh, confirmed through all of the kind of baseline existing conditions analysis that there's just really not a lot of bike infrastructure um, in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, we also really wanted to, and this is the key, these next two points were the really key ones for me. Um, we really wanted to better understand the program usage. We wanted to understand where users were going to use these bikes, how much they were using the bikes, um, what type of trips were potentially being replaced. Um, again, really trying to drive at that point of what is the VMT impacts of a program uh, like this. Um, and then we also wanted to really enhance that participation. Part of this was um, really for the the program needed to do it and needs to do it just because, as I said, there's no, the operational funding comes exclusively from um, membership fees. And that is really challenging to sustain a program like that. But we really wanted to find innovate, more innovative ways to get people to use the program um, and really specifically to get people to try out the bikes. That as when we kind of did some of our initial work, even in the early launch days of GoSGV uh, phase two, as I call it, um, we, there was a lot that one of the major barriers is people were kind of just overwhelmed. Like they didn't really, they were scared of trying out the bike in the first place. There was just that barrier to even wanting to try. So having the opportunity to even just try the bike and realize that not only was it a, a good, um, easy to use, it was also potentially a really good option for transit. Um, so we really wanted to enhance those um, opportunities for outreach and then also really focus on those larger businesses and universities that may have kind of that critical mass of people that might be potential writers for the program. So we really wanted to build those partnerships as well. So this gets into what we've uh, really found with the program. So as I said, we are still finalizing everything. We've found a lot of really good information um, in terms of kind of what the existing um, environment looks like and kind of where users' needs and motivations are. Um, the kind of the VMT analysis piece, that part is this part that's still ongoing. And I think this really speaks to one of the key challenges that we've had um, is around the data collection. And just to note, the, the bikes themselves don't really have don't a passive mechanism of collecting trip information. There is a GPS a tile device that's located on the bike, but they're really predominantly used for kind of tracking down bikes that are lost and stolen. Um, and there's an odometer. So there's not a lot of um, there's nothing else that can be used to really ev evaluate where the how much the bike has been used and where the the bike has gone, um, which that obviously was a large challenge for Alta. We spent have spent a lot of time really kind of trying to work through that and find other opp opportunities to address it. Um, but where we really landed, is that really there was has been an, a reliance on participant surveys for trip trip tracking, which can have its benefits. Obviously, we can get a little bit more qualitative information um, about what users are doing, but it also then requires that the users are actually completing the surveys. Obviously, one way of doing that can be having some sort of incentive to encourage participation, um, but we really haven't, didn't have, neither Alta nor the COG had resources to really ha have a lot of incentives. It was kind of the best we could do was a free membership for a couple of months for GoSGV. Um, so Alta really has had to get creative um, and make things really as easy as possible um, to try to get that information that can be really, really and help to inform even more uh, the potential VMT impacts of the program. Um, but on the plus side, we have had a lot of success um, with the outreach and engagement and driving more users to the program. Um, Alta and their subconsultant day one was really, um, really active throughout the region. They went to a lot of events with bikes and got a lot of people on the bikes where pretty much universally everyone said how excited they were to try it out. Um, and how great it was. And just hearing kind of the the stories about people who tried out the bike, especially the cargo bike and said, hey, wait a second, I actually don't need my second car. I can actually truly use a cargo bike, e-bike for my um, for my short trips. Um, so that's been great. And the other um, 
place where we've had a lot of success is building partnerships with new partners. Um, one of them was for um, with was with Caltech. They basically set it, stood up their own uh, bike library within the library at Caltech, which has basically allowed students to use the bikes around campus, which has been super exciting. And it was a, honestly a partnership that probably wouldn't have come about without this without this program. Um, with Metrolink, obviously a key component of this program was um, enhancing kind of those first last mile connections. Um, so that partnership with Metrolink is just getting off the ground, but kind of that shared co-marketing. Um, and also Metrolink even has provided some uh, discount codes and, and free tickets for users of the GoSGB program. Um, and we also have gotten a long list of uh, partners that we're really excited to continue to gauge with um, some of the universities here in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, so this has been a really great launching off point as well uh, for the program because we're super excited um, that we did receive funding for expansion through a couple of grant programs. We're going to be able to ad enhance the size of the, the fleet, um, especially with the cargo e-bikes. Those are actually the more popular bikes because um, people really appreciate having that ability to, to, to actually move goods around. Um, so we'll be able to purchase more bikes, addressing the fact that we just didn't really have haven't had that much that great of GPS tools, um, being able to purchase some of those tools to even better evaluate some of the, the GHG and VMT impacts. Um, we'll be able to subsidize memberships for income eligible residents. And also for those that are kind of transitioning are so interested in e-bikes that they want to own their own, um, having an e-bike rebate program for income eligible residents. And really this program has been a great launching off point um, for some of this evaluation work. So we're gonna continue to do that um, as we expand with this with this new funding to be able to even even like I said, even better understand and test out our hypothesis that this type of um, bike share program has um, some strong VMT impacts for especially suburban regions. So with that, I will end there. Thank you so much, Caitlin. We've got um, actually a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe we can spend a minute or so on them. Um, I'll say the first one, monthly fees appear high for individuals. Did you explore renting out bikes to businesses or a group of users so they can share the bikes and the per, piece, per person monthly fee is reduced? Yes, I actually, I don't disagree with you that the monthly fees are high. We've been going back and forth with our operator a little bit on this. Um, so yes, they there are a couple of businesses um, where they've done that. There's a couple of of actually there's a couple of school like Caltech I think I think they did that with Caltech um and there's one other school that did that but I think that is what the next kind of space where it's it's nice that we got this kind of starting point with some of these businesses through this program because that to me is like I agree with you is kind of the next area not only from a funding perspective but just from like the ease of use perspective I think is really important um and I think I see the next question, data collected on where folks would park their bikes and whether that is enough. Yes, I, that that actually is we're working with. Um, we will be working with another set of evaluators moving forward. Um, and there's some actually really cool um, technology that it's basically GPS actually on the locks um, that when a user locks their bike, it, that's where you can get the information about where the bikes are actually being parked. And that would that will really help to drive that kind of question. Like, is there sufficient park, bike parking infrastructure? Um, to address the program. And I'll say, yeah, the, the bikes themselves, e-bikes themselves are slightly larger and they're definitely heavier. Um, but for the most part, they actually do fit relatively well. Like there doesn't need to be major changes to any existing parking infrastructure um, to that. And then yes, in terms of VMT, yeah, 100%. Um, that has been my focus. Like that is why I've been so primarily focused on the VMT um, Using that as a mitigation tool, um, there the Cog had Senior Valley Cog had did some initial work um, with the VMT Bank, which is kind of paused at the moment. But that has always been that has been my personal goal on this. Um, and how do you share your data with local orgs? We don't do much data sharing at this particular point. Um, the most active data a local org we have actually is Active SGV, um, and they happen to be the ones uh, running the program. So I think that's a good space. Like as we especially as we are, are kind of moving into the next phase of the project, thinking about how to um, best share data with organizations and to make it as most as impactful as possible. 
Thank you so much. That's great. And I appreciate you taking some questions here on the fly. Um, that's everything from the chat currently. So um, again, remember everyone, feel free to keep dropping your chats, uh, your questions in the chat. If we don't get to them now, we will get to them at the end. Um, but that being said, we will turn it over now to Chris from Laguna Woods. And thank you again, Caitlin, for your presentation. All right. Uh, well, thank you for uh, having me today. I appreciate SCAG's invitation, but also um, SCAG funding this work in the first place. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this part of the presentation, but I do think it's important to talk briefly about the city of Laguna Woods for some context in why the study looks like it does. Um, we are in South Orange County. We are just south of the city of Irvine. We are just east of the city of Laguna Beach on the west side of Interstate 5. Small city, about three square miles, um, primarily multifamily uh, housing, population just under 18,000. Um, but one of the things that makes us very, very unique is um, the, the age demographics of our population. So as of the 2020 census, our median age is 74.9 years. That's down slightly um, from the 2010 census. And 91% of our residents are at least 60 years of age. So when we um, submitted this application for the development of a mobility technology plan, we had specific interests in exploring ways that we might address the unique needs of older adults and also individuals with disabilities or, or other levels of varying ability using automated vehicles, connected vehicles, other types of emerging transportation technologies. Uh, we did receive funding from SCAG or SCAG funded this project, I should say. Uh, and our consultant was Arcadis. They're now Arcadis IBI group. Um, they worked with us to prepare the mobility technology plan, a series of uh, technical memos as well that um, I'll talk about in just a minute. The main plan itself, um, it's organized into seven different chapters. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about public outreach and the state of the industry pieces today, um, as well as some of the concept of operations, but we did spend some time uh, looking at uh, the complexities and considerations that would need to be provided uh, with respect to data sharing um, in a, in an automated vehicle setting, as well as some of the physical modifications, um, roadway modifications, infrastructure modifications that would be necessary to uh, make this type of project possible. Um, and then we also did some work on um, kind of looking ahead to uh, performance monitoring. If we did get into the automated vehicle space, what would success look like? How would we evaluate that? Uh, and use that data to refine the program into the future. Um, public outreach and engagement was a big part of this project. So I, I said at the beginning that we um, were specifically looking at addressing the needs of uh, seniors, uh, older adults, and um, people with varying abilities um, in this sort of emerging technology space. So we assembled an advocacy group of eight organizations. Those organizations um, included uh, local nonprofits, they included surrounding cities, um, other affected transportation agencies, um, and then some local community groups as well. Um, and then we assembled a second uh, group, a resident group, that uh, consisted of 14 individuals. They ranged in age, um, again, all seniors, but uh, ranged in age, they had um, varying levels of mobility impairments, um, other types of, of physical challenges. Uh, and then they, they also had a variety of different levels of comfort and use of existing transportation options. Some people had vehicles, some people relied on town car or taxi services. Um, some people use golf carts, uh, a whole variety of, of people trying to get a good cross section of um, people whose needs might be um, helped or addressed in some manner with the use of automated technology. Uh, and then we also involved our city council in the process. There were three public meetings held with them, each with an opportunity for public comments. 
generally speaking, one at the beginning, one kind of as a check-in uh, towards the middle of the process, I believe right after our initial advocacy group and resident group meetings, and then a presentation at the end when the plan itself was complete. One of the things that we asked the consultant to do was um, spend a bit of time pulling together best practices from throughout the country. Um, there are a lot of good examples of automated vehicle pilot programs. Um, there's a couple shown on the screen here. The one on the left from the city of Detroit is actually very similar to what we ended up um, proposing in this plan, uh, which was a short fixed route um, transportation system, a uh, little over a mile in the service area that connected an older population to uh, local hospital and medical resources in the Detroit area. Um, and then uh, part of our plan, we have some uh, more fleshed out case studies uh, in one of the appendices. One of those is Golden, Colorado. Um, that's their easy mile uh, pilot program that operated for four months in 2021. Um, that program um, was a little bit different than the Detroit one, but it uh, focused on a downtown and college area. Again, a, a relatively small um, uh, route uh, and some specific considerations to avoiding traffic signals and other um, technologies that complicate the use of automated vehicles, at least in present day. So the plan itself has a lot of this type of information about what's going on um, and the lessons learned in, in other jurisdictions. The plan itself has three um, phased recommendations. It was very important to the city that um, the plan itself not be contingent on necessarily moving forward right now with automated uh, vehicle technologies. So the first phase stands on its own, irrespective of whether phases two or three are ever pursued. We talk about it as our readiness phase. This would be physical and programmatic type uh, improvements that um, would benefit either public deployments of automated vehicles or just the kind of advent of, of private uh, automated vehicles or connected vehicles. Um, so this phase talks about things like um, uh, managing the infrastructure to improve visibility and completeness of striping, um, taking a look at sign placement to make sure they're within a field of view for automated vehicles, um, and then really taking a look at our readiness for some of the more technical components, um, roadside uh, technology necessary for autonomous vehicles. Um, one of those for us is moving from uh, copper uh, wiring for our traffic signals to fiber optics to allow for the increased bandwidth to be able to even conceivably support that type of technology in the future. The second phase is an actual pilot program. This would be a small local fixed route shuttle service that would allow the city to uh, test the physical and programmatic improvements that we made in phase one, um, but also would give us the ability to prove the concept of um, autonomous vehicles on, on some sort of fixed route um, service. Phase three would then, predicated on phase two being a success, look to continue or expand that program. Um, specifically, obviously looking to expand the reach of that uh, route, but recognizing that there's a level of regional partnership necessary, um, especially in areas like South Orange County where there are quite a few cities uh, in close proximity to each other. So looking at some of those uh, regional partnership opportunities, but also looking at first and last mile connections and making sure that uh, we've done what we can to eliminate barriers that um, might otherwise impede either seniors or uh, individuals of varying abilities from gaining access to the autonomous vehicle uh, route service in the first place. When we went through this process and talked with our advocacy group and our resident group, we did identify a couple of near-term challenges. Um, that phase two autonomous vehicle pilot program we recognize that even if we prove the concept, it's likely to not be well received. Um, feedback is likely to skew negative for a variety of reasons. Um, 
not the least of which is, you know, customers, especially using uh, ride sharing services are accustomed to uh, having those first and last mile connections and being able to partake in the kind of spontaneous travel that a fixed route pilot really doesn't lend itself to on such a small scale. Um, we also recognize that it might be difficult for customers to really perceive that there's a benefit to the autonomous vehicle uh, shuttle service, uh, primarily because at this point in vehicle staffing would still be required. And that's obviously required as a result of fully automated vehicles not yet being on the market or being available. And then we recognize there's probably a level of inevitability here that in vehicle staffing for some populations would be necessary. Um, the varyingly abled populations may require assistance on or off the automated uh, shuttle. And so these were some of the things that we looked at when contemplating whether or not to proceed with phase two. Um, we ultimately have determined not to proceed with phase two at this point, but instead to stay focused on uh, monitoring advancements in the sector, um, picking our moment essentially for uh, when we decide to embark on phase two, and then um, working a little bit on phase one. So working on some of those roadway surface markings, um, some of our readiness for this uh, vehicle to infrastructure uh, technology. Again, things like fiber optics, um, some of the smaller scale roadway modifications um, that will put us in a, a better position to leverage this technology in the future. So um, the plan itself obviously exists and we're happy to share that. Uh, I did wanna highlight a couple of things in the plan that I think are um, particularly important or um, maybe interesting for some other SCAG jurisdictions. Because of our unique demographics, there are there's a lot of narrative um, and analysis in there related to uh, senior and varyingly abled populations. Um, that was something that in looking at case studies in other jurisdictions, we really didn't find. Um, we also spent some time on data sharing and cybersecurity considerations, particularly looking towards a phase three deployment where multiple cities or other jurisdictions might be working in tandem to operate some sort of um, either fixed route or more dynamic service. Um, and then we all have some of those considerations in there about uh, physical transportation infrastructure. Another thing that was missing from some of the case studies that we explored in other jurisdictions was really the means by which we would measure success. So there's a good amount of detail in the mobility technology plan prepared for Laguna Woods that identifies performance indicators by different types of categories. I've listed some on this slide here, um, but those are really universal. Those are things that if you're looking for insight into how to evaluate um, not just pilot programs, but really autonomous vehicle deployment in the future, um, some of the KPIs that we've identified might be interesting for you to take a look at. Um, and then finally, there are a series of technical memoranda that expand on what we discuss in the mobility technology plan. Just a little bit greater detail um, that we separated from the plan itself to not bog it down in, in too much jargon and other information. Uh, I'm just gonna put my contact information on the screen here and then um, also uh, our public works administrator, April Baumgarten, either of us would be happy to answer any questions for you after this meeting or um, provide you with copies of the plan, technical memoranda, uh, anything you're, you're interested in. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Marissa. Thank you so much, Chris. And, you know, we, we can take a question or two, a quick question if we've got them, although I don't see any in the chat right now. So um, just briefly, I'll see if there's any raised hands here. And then I'm not seeing any of those either. Okay, well, if that is the case, then I will take back over. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and again, if you've got questions, please keep dropping them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, that being said, I will pull up and share my screen again, and we can jump into the rest of the presentation that I have for us. All right, so back where we left off. 
as promised, some program conclusions. So uh, we've heard from our great presentation uh, speakers, and thank you so much for um, you know providing your time and your thoughts today. That technical dive so helpful for some of these projects. I will now provide some overview on all of the other projects that we haven't talked about from the Future Community Pilot Program and from the Smart Cities and Mobility Innovations Program. And there's several with them, so bear with me, but I will run through them pretty quickly and then we'll talk about programming and get to question and answers. So. Uh, just to start off here, the City of Anaheim Smart City Center Project, uh, we partnered with the Anaheim Transportation Network, and we were integrating real-time parking guidance for their, their center city area, um, and this was using their transit planning and ride hailing mobile application known as FRAN, if you're not familiar, the free rides around the neighborhood, um, which is an electric shuttle, and this helped to direct drivers to available parking via real-time wayfinding signage and the FRAN application. Uh, this really did a great job of reducing neighborhood parking complaints. Uh, we also can note that we served over 160,000 customers in this particular pilot. Um, and VMT was reduced by cars no longer needing to circle around parking structures or neighborhood streets looking for parking spots. We also have the City of Cerritos, uh, one of these online permitting portal type projects uh, where essentially the city implemented a community development related and business license application uh, online, just a portal to handle all types of applications and such related to those things. Um, this eliminated the need to physically travel to City Hall, which removed over 68,000 trips um, as far as VMT goes, or sorry, removed over 68,000 miles for VMT and then over uh, 2,800 trips annually, folks that did not need to go to City Hall anymore. Um, this was estimated to have saved the cost essentially of having to hire two full-time positions um, to keep up with the amount of volume. So that's a really great cost saving. Um, and this was also really popular as it came about during the COVID-19 pandemic when people already didn't want to have to, you know, go into City Hall. So uh, it was really great timing on that part. Um, and, you know, the increase in submissions due to the ease of the platform was wonderful as well. Now, as far as LADOT's Blue LA Electric Car Share project, uh, we did have a pilot to help uh, verify the VMT impacts and benefits of car share service. Um, we were specifically looking at transportation behavior, but also looking at origin destination data um, provided by our drivers. Uh, we could then look at encouraging enrollment, uh, looking at some car share strategies, things like that. Uh, we also did some outreach with housing developers. Uh, we can confirm that this saved over six million dollars in fuel annually for all the participants so that's a customer side benefit but that's a lot of fuel savings um, and then additionally the program really reflected a shift in community preferences because it's a very popular program and they have a really great retention of drivers folks that want to stay in the program and keep using the car share fleet so um, 90 percent of the members remained in the program after our pilot uh, additionally we have the city of ontario's smart city Rapid Validation Hub, and this was essentially creating a real-world technology testing zone. Uh, a couple things that were piloted included smart bin commercial refuse, uh, final mile micromobility, things like that. This was also right in the middle of the pandemic, so it actually provided us an unexpected opportunity, right? Challenges can be opportunities too, uh, an unexpected opportunity to utilize those sensors to grab other sorts of data as well. So the city was able to use those sensors to see the impacts of public policy in near real time, which was really interesting to watch. Um, we removed over 100,000 VMT in vehicle miles traveled. We also serviced over 400,000 customers as a part of the program. Um, and this really seemed to be something popular. There was a lot of great community engagement when it came to the smart city events. So there's a lot of interest there. We also have the City of Glendale's Route Optimization Program. This is where we optimized and redesigned the city refuse collection routes using software analytics. Uh, we were very pleased to see that we had a 13% overall decrease in vehicle miles traveled, including 49 fewer journeys to the dump each week. So that's um, a good amount of trips for these trash haulers. Um, and then additionally, this saved the city from having to spend any money on labor overtime. Um, and there were a lot of really positive key performance indicators for this being um, a more efficient way to conduct business. So uh, 
That was the Glendale pilot. We also have the city of Monrovia's Biking for Bucks, not too dissimilar to what Caitlin was just describing with San Gabriel Valley, but this is another bike share program. Uh, we have 503 participants and uh, I would say it seemed pretty successful. About 89% of them were very, very diligent about using their bike um, and participating in the program. Um, applicants were asked to complete surveys and track their bike trips using an activity tracker. We were able to determine that about 24,000 VMT can be saved every year. Um, and users also saved about $1,000 annually too on just the cost, gas, wear and tear of their own vehicle, things like that. Um, and this program did provide some really valuable insight into bike share preferences and behaviors. Now we also have the city of Riverside. This is another one of those um, online portal types of solutions. They developed an online software that allows all of the community development related permits and applications to be submitted online, which also removed 146,000 vehicle miles traveled annually. Um, it reduced over um, 11,000 trips and reduced driving hours even by almost 5,000 hours. And there was a staff hourly labor reduction too that um, using the system was able to create efficient Efficiencies elsewhere that we could see some cost savings too. Um, and then we have the San Bernardino County Remote Electronic Warrants Program, another online tool. Uh, this is a very specific software program for officers and judges to submit, review, and sign warrants. Uh, previously, sheriffs had to drive to only specific county um, courthouse locations to process these types of things. Um, instead, they now had an online platform. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, San Bernardino County is the largest county in the U.S. Um, so thinking about all of the trips we were able to save there, some very, very long trips, uh, we were able to remove over 400,000 vehicle miles traveled in less than two years. And this reduced over 24,000 trips annually as well. Now moving on to our Smart Cities and Mobility Innovations bunch of projects. These are the ones that are housed under the Sustainable Communities Program. Uh, diving right in here to Rialto, this is where we have our Smart Cities plan for warehousing and logistics. We essentially were looking at uh, warehousing and logistic conditions, uh, looking at quantified costs and benefits, evaluating technical and policy solutions. Uh, we were looking at the very specific adopted truck routes in the residential areas along those routes and how they can connect to warehousing hubs. Um, and this is intended to create kind of a network that we can really look at first and last mile trips. Um, and then this also produced an implementation plan of a pilot project, including goals, policies, and programs for regulatory changes, um, and all the different types of benefits that we seek to obtain in that kind of a pilot. As far as the cities of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and Stanton in this program, they were all participating, as we mentioned before, in this curb data collection inventory process. Now this builds off of our curb space management strategy that we developed back in 2022. Um, but this is a study where we were able to look at all three of these cities, specifically look at some study areas within those cities, um, develop some pilot projects and a work plan for all three that could then be implemented in their jurisdictions um, based on what we gathered in the planning process. Now, as you can see here at the bottom, we have some recommended pilot projects as well. So you can see we have um, we have the city of Los Angeles, the Westward, Westwood neighborhood flex zone. So we talked about that a little earlier as well um, in Zach's presentation. But then we also have the Long Beach Automated Enforcement Pilot Program and the Permit Parking Program update as well for Stan. Now we've heard a little bit about the San Gabriel Valley Council of Governments project as well. Just a very quick high level uh, summary here for you that, you know, this was really looking at an assessment of their already existing bike share program where we were looking to determine its effectiveness and see what other types of expansions and other types of, um, you know, opportunities we have. Uh, and you can see that there was a really robust community engagement campaign with a lot of innovative things as well. And as far as Desert Hot Springs goes, we have a downtown and light industrial parking plan that we produced. Uh, this looked at the current parking and access needs for downtown and also included their industrial cannabis area um, because we know there's gonna be a lot of future growth there. 
Uh, we were looking at parking supply and demand, land use patterns, shared mobility services. Uh, and we developed a list of short-term and long-term strategies that I think are pretty applicable for probably some pretty similar communities, uh, you know, looking at repealing minimum parking requirements, looking at investing in new parking technologies, creating parking specific districts. Um, these are all strategies that we've certainly seen elsewhere in the region. And then I think this might be the last one, the city of Garden Grove, um, the curb data study that we were doing with Garden Grove also analyzed and quantified residential parking and access challenges, looking in a couple of specific study areas. We had seen that many of the cities, uh, their street parking utilization exceeds 85%, indicating that they do have some challenges that they need to look at and think about demand parking demand management interventions. Uh, and then additionally, we put together a menu of different planning and policy options to address these parking issues. And they included everything from um, enforcement of existing parking regulations to creating new districts, new parking regulations, new parking agreements, things like that. Oh, of course, no, <laughs> one more and it's Laguna Woods. And we did hear from Chris already on this project a little bit, but just at a high level, again, this was a roadmap for AV pilot implementation. Uh, as Chris had described, phase one is essentially what's been completed that, you know, looking at those physical modifications and putting together what a pilot could look like. Um, and then phase two and phase three will be things that come later when the timing is right. Now, some key takeaways before we turn into overall programming updates. Um, online portals are incredibly popular and growing in demand with many opportunities in a lot of different contexts. We see them with um, permitting for, you know, let's say housing community development. But we can also see them in the case of San Bernardino County using them for um, sheriff permits or sheriff warrants, I should say. So a lot of different types of contexts in which online portals can be really useful um, as far as a digital tool. We also see that route optimization projects are greatly impacted by available resources and constraints. We know bike share and parking programs do have the potential for significant VMT reduction, but there's some, you know, price components about bike share that can make it a little more costly depending on how the program is structured. So there's some nuance there as well. Um, curb use demand continues to increase and this is something that I'm sure we're gonna be seeing more of here in our region in the future, understanding what curb use demand looks like and planning for that. Um, additionally, technology continues to be an effective tool for parking um, and for identifying curb assets, things like that. We also know in all of this work and all these projects, we've learned that vendors and consultants are navigating a very new procurement space just like we are. Um, so that being said, that's part of what prompted us to create our emerging technology guiding principles in the first place. Additionally, pilots and projects have been successful in meeting program goals, and I can't stress this enough. It's really helpful for us to understand the benefits and challenges with each technology. That's why piloting things is so important. We know what works, we know what doesn't work, and these are the things that we can learn along the way. And then finally, um, all of these products that we've talked about today really complement the release of Connect SoCal 2024, but also help us prepare for the next sustainable community program funding cycle, which will be paying for more smart cities and mobility related types of projects. So do keep an eye out for that. It's not expected this fiscal year necessarily. I think the smart city stuff is going to come a little later, but we do expect that funding cycle to kick off summer of 2025. So there will be more information at that time about additional funding for smart cities and mobility innovation pilots. Now, just some quick best practices. I'm sure a lot of these are probably gonna seem pretty familiar to you all, but these are the things that we've learned in you know going through both of these programs. One, cross-agency task forces are so critical to make sure that we're collaborating with a diverse amount of stakeholders and groups across the region. Two, we also need to make sure that we're thinking about comprehensive regulatory frameworks, things like the emerging technology guiding principles. Those types of things that can provide that guidance in that regulatory framework are very critical. We also know that public-private partnerships are really important, and there's not really a good one-size-fits-all kind of public-private partnership. It, it, it a lot of times comes down to the specific project, the members you have on your team, and, you know, like I said, there's no one size fits all kind of approach. So really thinking about how you can be unique in these public private partnerships to make things happen can go a long way. Additionally, infrastructure investments. I know we've heard this from our presentation, um, our, our partner presenters earlier that the infrastructure is such a critical important 
part to make sure that you have that before you move on to some of these other implementation aspects. So, you know, making sure infrastructure is a part of the equation, absolutely important. Also community engagement and education, um, making sure that we create spaces to pilot, uh, to create these kinds of like test beds and hubs for pilots, uh, you know, looking at the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator, Incubator Lacey, that's another really great example. Um, and then finally, making sure that we're coordinating with research institutions and that we as regional MPOs and regional government, that we're doing our best as far as monitoring and evaluation. That's where we can really um, shine as far as like a regional government kind of a role, we can help to do the monitoring and evaluation across the region for these types of projects. So that's everything on the projects that we've completed to date. Uh, just before we wrap up with Q&A, I will spend a few minutes going through the program, the tools, and the resources we want to leave you with. Now, upcoming and ongoing projects that we've got going on, I know I mentioned our last mile freight program still is underway. Same with our zero emission truck infrastructure study. Those two are both still underway. Um, we also have our Clean Cities Coalition. We are always doing stuff. We always have yearly deliverables that are due for those. They include things like our strategic plan. Uh, we do a lot of tracking when it comes to alternative fuel, whether it's prices, vehicles, new stations, we track all of that. We also have our annual progress report and various partnerships and educational events that we participate in. Um, so always be sure to you know take a look at our Clean Cities Coalition website, see what we're up to. We also have our presidential priorities that will drive the type of programming that you can expect to see from SCAG in the next year. Those include transit recovery, clean technology, and goods movement, all of which are touched upon by many different pilots and projects that we talked about today. So expect to see more from us in those areas. We also have a smart city strategic plan coming soon and the future uh, sustainable community program calls for projects. As I mentioned, we will be doing more calls for projects for more smart city and mobility innovation type projects. More information will be available summer 2025. And just a couple of slides on our upcoming RFP for a smart city strategic plan. This is not a plan that we have written before. Obviously a lot's changed since our future communities framework from seven years ago. Uh, so we're really looking at pulling together all the great stuff that we've talked about today um, and, and how can we put this into a strategic plan that outlines what we would like to accomplish for the next three to five years and helps to get all of us in the same page. Um, so this is something we will be working on uh, this fiscal year and into the next fiscal year as well. You will see more information about this from us too. And we do plan on putting together a working group for the Smart City Strategic Plan. Uh, we do not know what this is going to look like yet. Uh, we plan on, you know, whichever consultant is helping us with the strategic planning process will help us form this group, help it, you know, kind of take its shape and everything. Uh, but we do anticipate and would love to have stakeholders and representatives from all sorts of diverse backgrounds, from all sorts of different parts of the industry. Um, we really want to have a group that can help guide the strategic planning process. And then, you know, it could potentially also be used as a group that meets quarterly or as needed as just a regional forum, um, just for open collaboration and education and things like that. So a lot of opportunities. We would like to create a working group to, to supplement and um, provide support for that planning process as well. So more info on that in the coming months. And then lastly, a part of that process will include us developing some sort of EV incentive program. Again, we're still figuring out what this looks like, but we know that this is something we, it's a space we'd like to do more in. Um, and obviously we'd like to complement existing incentive programs. We're not looking to replace any, but we're looking to see what role SCAG could have in incentive programs for electric vehicles and for electric vehicle charging stations. What can that look like? And especially how can we make sure that we're focused on things like multi-use unit dwellings, uh, high density areas, lower income households, um, and prioritizing equity communities. So we've got a lot of work that we'll be doing as a part of this strategic plan. Be on the lookout this, this particular fiscal year, you'll see a lot of updates for us on that. And then lastly, some additional tools and resources. I've got the link for our data platform, our scenario planning model resources, our GIS open data portal in our local investment dashboard. And then finally, we've talked about so much stuff today. I wanted to make sure we included all the links so you'll see a whole lot of uh, URLs here. Um, these are all the many things that we've discussed that we've been working on for the last you know, two or three years. Um, in all of the pilots and projects that you've seen us discuss today, there's more information available about that on the web as well. So 
That takes us to the end of the presentation. We've got 10 minutes left for question and answer. I've got some URL links here as well for both the Future Communities Pilot Program and the Sustainable Communities Program. And then additionally, my contact information is here below. My colleague, Shannon, also feel free to email either of us. We're happy to support, answer any of your questions. And with that, um, I will pause. We do have this survey here, but I know we wanna do question and answer. So, um, I can leave this up, but we can otherwise open up the floor to see if there's any um, any questions in the chat. Oh, thank you. And I see actually Amanda just dropped the link into the chat for the survey, so I don't have to leave the QR code up. Thank you. All right, so I see one question. Um, from Maddie, just went live with our digital permitting system in June, never thought of the VMT correlation. Hmm. Yeah, so I imagine these technology upgrades and portals are going to become a lot more prevalent. We already, I mean, it sounds like folks are already very interested in the region and we do get a good amount of inquiries about these. <clears throat> so I agree, supporting um, and encouraging that process to make sure that, you know, folks can implement these portals, but then also that we can tie into and see what some of the VMT reduction, staffing cost reductions, things like that are. Um, absolutely agree with you. We want to make sure that we can share that information. Um, we want to make sure that there's any best practices, perspectives, lessons learned that we can offer. So yes, absolutely agree with you. Something we can talk about more offline as well. And... I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, I know there was one earlier I wanted to make sure that we got to. Um, so one of the questions uh, for San Gabriel Valley in, and for SCAG, generally speaking, um, for when cities are hosting bike sharing programs, do they have locally specific laws or ordinances around e-bikes that affect the implementation of the program? And I understand in my experience, the answer is usually yes. Uh, but Caitlin, I wanted to see if there was anything you wanted to add on that. Um, my answer is usually yes. Usually you've got to get management and legal involved. Um, I don't know that there's always laws and ordinances that are impacted, but there's certainly policy. I would say there's certainly policy impacts from that. Yeah. And I'll say like, and this is one of the reasons, honestly, that we switched my, I don't know what's up with my lighting. It takes like a second for my camera to calm down, I guess. Um, but generally speaking for the program that we're operating now, it hasn't required any policies or ordinances, but I will say when we were doing the um, initial bike share program, a lot of the cities elected to actually adopt bike share ordinances kind of establishing, and it was more actually on the city side, they were interested on in doing it to kind of established that there would only be um, a certain vendor or vendors that were operating and kind of lay out the rules for where they um, could and could not do station siting. When we when we were doing that initial project, it was very collaborative um, between the um, gotcha that was the operator and the cities just to make sure um, that everyone had a comfort level with where things are, because obviously they are using, um, the stations are using the public right of way. So there's usually going to be some sort of sign off. And most, in most instances, I've seen that the yeah, entities have done, have gone the, the length of either doing some sort of like application process to formalize who the, the vendors are going to be, um, or at least doing like some sort of ordinance saying, this is, this is how you have to operate if you're going to operate. Appreciate that input. Thank you. Um, and one more that came into the comments, although it's just directed at me, not at everyone, but as an FYI, um, I do see this question about data and solutions for the Los Angeles 2028 Olympic Games. Um, what is SCAG doing? Are we working with the LA 28 Planning Committee? Yes, we are working with them. And yes, we are doing things. Um, I will. Um, I can follow up with you afterwards, specifically, uh, Nick, for your question. But yes, we are working on that. That is something that we are being very mindful about. Um, and we are kicking off a lot of efforts these days. So um, be on the lookout for stuff from SCAG on that as well. And I see this other question. Have you started looking at AI um, related opportunities? Oh yeah, to make better use of available data, route optimization, project identification, forecasting, things like that. Yes, um, we actually do have a pilot right now with the University of California, Irvine with UCI. Um, and we've been working in partnership with the city of Irvine as well. Uh, we're looking at AI when it, 
in regards to let's say traffic sensors and optimization of the traffic network. Um, so we have started looking at AI, at least in terms of sensors uh, and what types of data we can capture from that. We are relatively new in that space, but we are working in that space. We have at least one pilot <laughs> that we're currently working on with uh, City of Irvine and with UCI. Uh, and, you know, we're actually going to have a listening session for that one next month. So, uh, you know, kind of stay on the lookout for that. We'll we'll have more information and a listening session if you want to attend and give us your thoughts on AI as far as it relates to that specific project. So um, we will have more information and uh, follow up with that listening session as well. But absolutely agreed, AI is so important and something we are looking at. I don't see any other comments. Um, I'll do another another quick pass through and see if there's any raised hands. But if not, you know, I'll still stick around for the next five minutes in case any other questions come up. But that looks like that's everything from us right now. Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, and again, all of these materials will be made available to you and posted online. The recording from today, the PowerPoint slides, all of our contact information is included in those as well. So please let us know if you think of any other questions. Always feel free to reach out to us after the fact. Um, and I'll stick around for a few more minutes. I guess before we close out, Amanda, is there anything else that we should mention? No, that was very comprehensive. Thank you. All right, great. Well, like I said, I will stick around for a few more minutes in case there's any other questions, but uh, feel free to consider this the end of our Toolbox Tuesday here. I thank everybody again for their time. Thank you again to the presenters. We really appreciate you coming and sharing your expertise. Um, really appreciate everyone's time on the call today. Thank you. Guess while we're on the line, um, AV, will I get a copy of the chat as well? Can I get a copy of the chat as well when this is over? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Thank you. I'd like to follow up with the fo some folks. Yeah, well, I'll make Perfect. sure you get that. Thank you. Oh, I see. Also interested to hear what's being done with LA28. Yes, aren't we all? Um, I, I agree with you there. I don't have all the answers, but I know that we are very active in that planning space. I know our management team is coordinating with the LA28 folks. Um, I know I even have a call today at 4 p.m. to talk more about it. So uh, we are doing the work to coordinate. That is for sure. Yeah, I think it is just transit really is what our focus is at the time. but. Um, yeah, we'll see. I'm not privy to all of the conversations. Well, I see we are at 159. There's only a handful of us on the call anyways. Um, I say we go ahead and wrap it up. So thanks, team. Thanks, everybody, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, we can follow up afterwards. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.